Hi, I'm Nicholas Rosinski, and I'm here to extend an invitation to a small group collaboration on what I call the computational neurophysics of matter and conscious experience. This group will do real rigorous science while at the same time seeking to complete a coherent transformational spectrum aimed at bridging the apparently intractable gap between science and spirituality. Very briefly, my initial academic trainings were at Cambridge in mathematics and theoretical physics, and then later at UCSD in computational neurobiology. And for the last dozen years or so, I've been working on this computational neurophysics approach outside the mainstream of academia. So the direct goal of this group's work will be to bring the computational neurophysics program back right into the heart of the mainstream. But the larger overall goal is to advance humankind's understanding of itself and the reality it inhabits towards a better life for everybody. So ideally, I'm looking for a group of four to six people, physicists, neuroscientists, perhaps computer science people and psychologists. Uh, definitely a group that shares a commitment to and passion for a transformational outlook, a transformation of science and of humankind more broadly. And to start with, the focus of the explicit focus of the group's work will be to collaborate on bringing two major existing pieces of work to the mainstream scientific marketplace, so to speak, predominantly via at least two high profile publications. So to begin with, this group will orient around a common transformational context, which I'll outline in a moment, and familiarize itself with the broad computational neurophysics approach, which I'll also be sketching uh, through this presentation, in order to co-create and or co-author co submissions. And the closing movement, movement for this incarnation of the group will be to consider next steps, perhaps looking towards grant applications to explore what I call the one experiment, which will be yet another thing that I'm gonna outline as we go. But let's start with this transformational context. Transformation obviously is a complex topic and I'm just gonna give a quick crude sketch. But if we look over a range of scales and viewpoints from God and soul to me as a body, and everything else perhaps as a material thing. Uh, in one view, alleged separation between and amongst all of these things, for example, between mind and body or between humans and nature uh, in a more general form. In, in one view, this alleged separation is the fundamental origin of all problems, whether personal, collective or planetary. So I'm not gonna to argue today uh, or in the group for the pivotal role of alleged separation, but some openness to this kind of viewpoint is pretty much synonymous with the shared transformational outlook that participants are gonna to need to share. So what is mainstream science's stance with respect to this whole separation issue? So the most open-minded view of mainstream science might admit that things like God, souls, and a mind that's more than just a material brain could exist. But under what I call dynamically orthodox physics, which I'll explain a bit further in a moment, none of these green text things can interact with any of these black text things. So allegedly, and in a way operationally, the green text things are effectively non-existent. And this matters because science is a powerful narrative. And we know that minds tend to seek congruence with the narratives they're invested in. So belief in dynamically orthodox physics can make these things recede from awareness, even though they actually exist. That's what I mean by kind of giving separation and operational existence. Now, what's to be done about this problem with mainstream science? So there are a number of existing transformational efforts that challenge the conclusions of dynamically orthodox physics by emphasizing, for example, the validity of spiritual or paranormal experience, or by challenging alleged metaphysical bases of science in what I call the isms debate. But for various reasons, um, 
including but not limited to psychological conditioning over here, mainstream science has typically rejected these challenges outright on grounds of validity or relevance, which has led to a more or less 50 year standoff uh, measuring this kind of engagement relative to the establishment of organizations like the Institute of Noetic Sciences or the Scientific and Medical Network in the early 1970s. So what's to be done? Well, the focus of this group will be to bridge this yawning gap, uh, a filling in that I also call completing a coherent spectrum of transformational activity completing because it fills in this gap and coherent because this bridge by design can have perfectly rational dialogues with both ends uh, of the gap. So towards the end of this presentation, I'll demonstrate briefly how this is possible, but specifically this bridge makes no reference at all to spiritual, paranormal or isms debates uh, in its engagement with mainstream science whilst at the same time being entirely capable of an engaged discussion on exactly those topics with existing transformational camps. So then the long-term transformational target of this activity is a new version of mainstream science, much closer to existing transformational activity and with a genuine openness to dialogue here as symbolically depicted by this dashed line boundary. Now, I should say that this bridging activity will also engender a shift in the transformational camps, as indicated by this little dash here. I won't go into this in any detail in this presentation, but this shift really has to do with what's the significance and nature of metaphysical critiques in relation to the transformation of science. Now, as I'll spend most of the rest of this presentation explaining, what I'm calling a new mainstream science is very different than other new science visions floating around out there, uh, particularly concerning an alleged interfacing of science and spirituality. But before I get to that, just to emphasize that the focus of this group will be uh, a transformational interaction with mainstream science rather than on connecting explicitly to existing transformational efforts, although there will be a distinct complementary group doing exactly that. Uh, so what is the strategy for this piece for engagement with mainstream science? So the first strategic point is not to appeal to any data or reasoning outside the mainstream science, outside of mainstream science's current domain or remit. Now, that may seem extraordinarily limiting, in fact, to make any kind of transformation impossible. But in fact, the strategy will reveal show-stopping limitations in as is mainstream science, using that science's own rules of conduct, and then offer a viable way out of those limitations, which later turns out to be a major step towards current transformational efforts. Now, the crucial starting point for all of this is to point out current science's dynamically orthodox character. This is a feature I've already mentioned, and it's a feature that I'll explain a little bit more very shortly. And it turns out that it's this dynamical orthodoxy and not really so-called materialism, which anchors the kind of separation that I pointed out earlier. And therefore this is the factor that must change. Next, we simply embrace the mainstream's goal, a complete logical experimentally tested explanation of all natural phenomena, but the really, really pivotal piece is a proof, and I mean that in a mathematical physics sense, that it's logically impossible to accomplish this mainstream goal under dynamically orthodox physics. Now, importantly, this proof isn't a metaphysical critique of materialism, but an information theoretic analysis of experiments in consciousness science, as I'll sketch in just a moment. Now, merely showing the impossibility of its goal might be equally impossible for the mainstream to accept and digest, were it not for an accompanying demonstration of dynamical regimes in which the goal can be accomplished, namely what I call strongly dynamically unorthodox physics. And demonstrating that together with the characterization of a viable experiment 
which can determine the matter of fact regime, dynamically orthodox or unorthodox, which actually pertains in our universe. I call this experiment the one experiment because it's the one that makes any other experiment in consciousness science viable, potentially. Finally, in the positive direction of creating a new mainstream science out of the ashes of dynamical orthodoxy, we have to offer a comprehensive, experimentally testable theory of conscious experience, uh, fixing a host of other theoretical problems over and above the dynamical orthodoxy issue, which I focused on here. And today I'll quickly show you one candidate here, which I call N theory. That's not N for Nicholas, by the way. Uh, at the end of this presentation. Okay, so to even begin this strategy, we have to overcome a fundamental tactical problem. There's no word for conscious experience in the language of hard sciences, which is essentially mathematical symbolism. Now, some people claim that we can't introduce conscious experience into so-called objective science because subjective qualities are ineffable, uh, meaning unspeakable. But as I explain in the chapter of a forthcoming book, The Science We Need, um, it's perfectly possible to F the ineffable, at least to the degree we need to do real consciousness science. Now, similarly, some people claim, and I'm, uh, I'm sympathetic to this, that we can't do consciousness science because it's impossible to define consciousness. Now that's true, but if we focus on the sub-phenomenon of conscious experience, it's quite easy to give a relative definition. For example, the conscious experience of a chair defined relative to the atoms and molecules of the chair, however those exist as matter, substance, information, whatever, are those atoms and molecules which participate in generation of the experience. Now, because the atoms and molecules are already part of mainstream science, this definition by contrast starts to link the study of conscious experience, uh, conscious experience with the study of so-called objective phenomena. Now that definition by contrast isn't really new, but what is new, and this is where we F conscious experience, so to speak, is to introduce a symbolism for it into the language of hard science. By taking a symbol in physics for an objective entity, a symbol like this italicized bird chair here, put angle brackets around it to denote conscious experience of that same objective entity thus creating this uh, new language or new entry in the language. And then these angle bracket symbols are crucial for this next crucial step, which is to prove that the mainstream goal is impossible under dynamically orthodox physics. And this proof is what I call the meter Hamiltonian argument, which you can find uh, more out about in this true consciousness science paper. And I'll give links references to that at the end. So one vital place for angle bracket symbolism in all of that is in formally defining dynamically orthodox physics. So this is any physical theory which contains angle bracket symbols, but which limits the transformation of information about what angle bracket symbols label. So in a dynamically orthodox setting, certain configurations of orthodox entities might give rise to specific angle bracket states, but those angle bracket states can't act back in any way on fundamental entities. The important point, certain brain states might participate in uh, creating an angle brackets labeled experience of redness, say, but that same angle brackets labeled redness can't influence brain dynamics in, in any way under dynamical orthodoxy. Now, obviously any science of conscious experience as well as collecting data about brains must also collect data about conscious experience as well as the stimuli evoking those experiences. But it's possible to prove as a theorem, and perhaps you can already see it intuitively from this definition, that the verbal report here of conscious experience or any behavioral report actually under dynamically orthodox physics will be scientifically meaningless. So a dynamically orthodox science of experience fails, not because experience you know, can't be a property of matter as many current transformational efforts want to claim, but because it's impossible to do report-based experiments if matter is dynamically orthodox. Equally though, 
it's impossible to do experiments under dynamically orthodox idealism, for example. So it's not about the metaphysics fundamentally. It's about the dynamic transfer of information. Emphatically, again, this isn't a proof that conscious experience can't be a property of matter. In fact, it's very straightforward to write down matter contingent theories of experience using angle bracket symbols. This is a proof that dynamically orthodox matter, which is the form of matter in every current and currently envisaged form of mainstream physical theory, can't support an experimental science of conscious experience. Okay. So then the question is, under what conditions does this impossibility of science proof fail? So simply, if every content of conscious experience here can couple with the brain, a regime that I call strongly dynamically unorthodox, the word strongly labels each and every aspect, then this proof here fails. Okay, so after all that from the true paper, if we live in a dynamically orthodox universe, there's no experimental science of conscious experience, and therefore the mainstream goal of a complete science of all natural phenomena fails. But if we live in a strongly dynamically unorthodox universe, then we could, at least in principle, both have a science of conscious experience and a science of all natural phenomena. So which is it in our universe? And then fortunately, there's an experiment uh, called the one experiment, which can determine that actual character of the universe we inhabit. So by comparing actual brain dynamics with a dynamically orthodox computer simulation, it's possible to test for orthodoxy and unorthodoxy. Then experimental evidence pointing towards strong unorthodoxy would satisfy the minimal conditions for an experimental science. But there are also a bunch of other theoretical obstacles that have to be fixed in order to create even a min minimally viable and coherent consciousness science or theory of consciousness. So this is important to complete the arc of first taking away any prospect for the mainstream goal under dynamical orthodoxy, and then offering a potentially complete path under strongly unorthodox dynamics. But it's also important for the place of this effort in a larger overall transformational project. So specifically recall that I claimed it's possible to talk both to mainstream science without invoking the spiritual and simultaneously engage the transformational community fully on that topic. And that the longer term goal is to birth a new science that's closer to and open to the transformational community. So now let me briefly illustrate by construction how a minimally viable, coherent, strongly dynamical, unorthodox theory of conscious experience can do all of that. Now, I'm not claiming that the end theory shown here is the one true theory of conscious experience at all. It does happen to be the only minimally viable hypothesis that I've seen to date. But the important, one important thing about it is it can be crucially interpreted in two distinct ways above and below the line. So above the line here, a conventional matter tree and a conventional matter brain participate in the creation of a conscious experience of a tree and conscious experience also couples with a form of super brain computation, which is necessary scientifically to resolve some theoretical problems I've mentioned before, specifically conundrum, conundrums about the evolution of this brain experience connection. But below the line, it's the same theory. We can throw away the matter, so to speak, and replace it by abstract information and extend our conception of the super brain material intelligence uh, the super brain computation into super material intelligence, oneness, mystery, and so forth. So the above the line version speaks to an extended or upgraded version of mainstream science. And the below the line version of the same theory speaks to a transformational spirituality. And the key thing, both above and below the line, is that information must be able to move from and through conscious experience to couple with an influence matter above the line for experiments and for evolutionary explanations, and below the line for spiritual information or insight 
to make itself known in the field of alleged matter. So any theory of this bridging kind, regardless of whether it takes this specific form, must be dynamically orthodox, which is why the whole strategy that I showed you at the beginning pivots around the orthodox unorthodox contrast. Wow, so that's a lot. And I've only really grazed the surface there. Now here's a tentative timeline for the group. Um, it starts out with uh, reading the two major existing manuscripts, True Consciousness Science and the One Experiment in the next couple of months, uh, leading to submissions starting in the fourth quarter of 2022. And then targets for spring 2023 include convening a workshop to look at making the one experiment actually happen. Now I've put URLs here for the preprints of the true and one papers, although really the, the go-to place is the Center for Dialogue in Science website, both for the papers and for these three books, establishing uh, context for the papers and a bunch of ancillary results. So to summarize, I'm looking for a small group of physicists, neuroscientists, perhaps, psychologists and computer scientists, ultimately, ultimately, to catalyze the funding and execution of initial versions of the one experiment, because it's experimental data establishing the dynamically unorthodox character of our inhabited reality that will catalyze a tectonic shift in mainstream science. Now, to get to the one experiment, the immediate goal will be to publish related work in major journals. And the overall reason for doing all of this is to establish a complete and coherent spectrum of transformational activities in science in the direction of deconstructing separation and fragmentation in the human condition. Now, given where we're starting from, about a year seems reasonable for the first incarnation of this group. Uh, I think I'm asking for a minimal commitment of three to four hours per week, more would be great, and that time would be split between reading and meeting. If you're interested in finding out more about this remarkable opportunity, please reach out to me and we can meet and see if we're a good mutual fit. Again, I'm Nicholas. Thanks so much for watching. Hope to see you again soon.